I mean, you have widely popularized the 478 breath. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what the 478 breath is? And, you know, when did this start coming into your awareness? And when did you start talking about it? It's a yoga technique. So again, thousands of years old. And uh, I learned it from Dr. Fulford. Uh, and I've been practicing it since probably the uh, early 1980s. And I have taught it. I teach it to every patient I come into contact with, to all of my students, uh, sometimes to very large groups of people. Um, it, it's so time efficient. It's just, you know, the method is simply uh, breathing in quietly through your nose to a count of four, holding your breath to account for a count of seven and blowing air out forcibly through your mouth to a count of eight and repeating that for four breath cycles when you're first learning it and doing that twice a day religiously. And that's all. And by simply doing that uh, over time, you know, over the space of a month or two months, you really change the dynamics of the involuntary nervous system, uh, decrease sympathetic tone, increase parasympathetic tone, the relaxation response, uh, lowers heart rate, lowers blood pressure, improves digestion, uh, um, really amazing results. And, and uh, it, it takes 30 seconds twice a day. I mean, I love recommendations like that, you know, very, very effective, but but free and accessible to everybody, which I think is something that I always try and keep at the back of my mind when, when talking about health. What, 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 there's this theme coming up, um, Andrew, which is, you know, mentioned inflammation before you were becoming aware in the maybe early 80s that there's this kind of root cause of chronic unresolved inflammation that may be behind or at least contributing in a large way to things like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, you know, depression, whatever. It's like, okay, great. You also mentioned that you teach the 478 breath to pretty much every single one of your patients. So what, what I really love is this understanding and this idea that there are some basics of health, right? There are some, mm -hmm. there are some common commonalities. That if we focus on the creation of health in the body, if we focus on reducing inflammation in the body through hopefully lots of, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle practices, we can tackle multiple different diseases, mm -hmm. even though we're not targeting them specifically. And and it's. You know, as you say that four, seven, eight breath, it sounds like you use that as prevention, as prophylaxis, but also as treatment when somebody has a problem. And I think this is in many ways changing the way that we look at medicine because we have been taught in a, in a certainly I was trained, what, maybe 30, 35 years after you but a very sort of quite a reductionist model. We're very good at giving labels to different diseases. We, we separate off the body into different specialities and that can have value, but also we, we, we forget that we're one interconnecting system. And if you change one part of that system, you also have a knock-on effect on other parts as well. Yeah, let me give you an example with the 478 breath. This is by far the most effective anti-anxiety measure that I've come across. It makes the drugs that we use for anxiety look very pathetic by comparison. And I have used that in patients with the most extreme forms of panic disorder uh, successfully, although in some cases it took some time of regular practice for them to get control of it. But the, the difference between treating a, an anxiety attack or panic disorder with a drug like a benzodiazepine and with the 478 breath, it's a very stark contrast. When people are panicked or in anxiety states, the subjective experience usually is of being out of control. If you deal with that by giving a, a, a medication you reinforce the false idea that the locus of control is external. And over time, that method becomes less and less effective and often creates dependence. If when a person discovers that they have within them the ability to control an anxiety state by regulation of the breath, it's a revelation. It's totally empowering. And that method becomes more effective with repetition and creates greater independence and greater autonomy. I mean, it just couldn't be a greater contrast of those two approaches. Yeah. Completely agree. It's about putting, it's just about 
It's about connecting the patient to what's going on, the feeling that they have got some control over. Otherwise, it's, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's not only the fact that the treatment itself has very few, if any, side effects, right? So that's, mm -hmm. but right. it's also, yeah. you know, it's also that empowerment. And, it, and I guess that kind of leads on to this term mind-body medicine, which I've heard you talk about a lot. And I think it's worth kind of really trying to understand, you know, what do you mean when you say mind body medicine? You know, do you see the mind and body as separate? Does society see it as separate? And, you know, what does that umbrella term really mean? I think mean? the only way you can separate mind and body is verbally. I think they are two poles of the same reality. Uh, and I think the uh, the reigning paradigm in Western science and medicine simply does not see that, you know, that we, we have a materialistic paradigm in place uh, that states that all that is real is that which is physical, that which can be touched, measured, um, I guess, in medicine taken out. Uh, and that if you observe a change in a physical system, the cause has to be physical. Non-physical causation of physical events simply is not allowed for in that paradigm. And this is why mind-body interactions have been never accorded their proper due, why research in that area has been stunted, why hypnosis has never been fully accepted as a medical modality, for example, why we can't make sense of, of uh, wart cures. I mean, there's a whole range of things, but uh, that, that is changing. And uh, some of the change has come about with uh, validating placebo responses through brain imaging and showing that there are correlations with you know, activity in particular areas of the brain. So this makes it accessible to people, gradually changing. But I would say there's, there's a whole range of therapies under the heading mind-body medicine from biofeedback, hypnosis, visualization, and so forth. In general, uh, these methods are very cost-effective, time-effective, even fun for both practitioner and patient. Uh, and yet they are very underutilized in medicine. And they're underutilized because we just don't take this kind of stuff seriously. In, in my clinical experience, I have again and again seen that the, the root causes of illness are in the non-physical compartment. Yeah. Unless that's dealt with, um, all the physical intervention that you do is not gonna solve the problem. It's tricky sometimes to uh, present this to patients because uh, many patients are very sensitive to being accused of making up their illness or imagining it, that it's all in their head. And that's not what is meant by this. I, I don't, you, it's very difficult to use the term psychosomatic because of that connotation. I don't think we've, as a profession, we've, we've got a bit of a bad reputation in the past for yep. telling people that their IBS, their irritable bowel syndrome is sort of kind of in right. their head or their fibromyalgia is sort of in their head. And I think, so there's a, there's a real defensiveness from people, understandably yeah. that- Understandably, right. The doctor's telling but, you me know, IBS my head. is clearly in the bowel as well as in the head. And, the, you know, everything is, is in both. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting that, isn't it? The mind and the body. And I guess now we're getting this field of research, which- I'm interested as to what state this was in in the 60s and 70s, but you know, the last five, 10 years, we've got the microbiome, the gut-brain axis, lots of research showing this bi-directional communication between body, our gut, and the mind in our brains. And you know, did, were you aware of this uh, early on? You know, what, what did the research say, or did you just intuitively and through your experience know that this was going on? I took a course in medical hypnosis at Columbia University uh, right after I finished my internship. It was one of the most fascinating courses I ever took and uh, certainly made me aware of the research that was out there and it, and it totally resonated with my own interests. So it's, I've paid attention to that for a long time. I uh, have a colleague that I worked with for many years who's on our faculty. Um, who is a, a teaching member of the American Academy of Clinical Hypnosis. And uh, I've sent him many patients. And I remember early on him saying to me that he thought that every 
uh, dermatological patient and every GI patient should first go to hypnotherapy before they went to dermatologists or gastroenterologists, because those two systems of the body have, have the highest ratio of innervation and connection to the mind. Um, and I've absolutely found that to be true. And, and another uh, experience I had uh, shortly after he said that, I, the, the leading gastroenterologist in Tucson asked me to have dinner with him. He's in his 60s. And he was very depressed and said that he hoped that I had something that could help him because he said 90% of the patients that he saw had conditions for which his training did not equip him to do anything about. I mean, that's remarkable. Um, and, and I think this is absolutely the way it is. And it's not just for GI disorders and dermatological disorders. It applies to many other things as well. And that doesn't mean you should not work on the physical problem, but you want to also be working on the non-physical aspect of it. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. Breathing is the life force. And you are able to stop it, to manipulate it. Take him on, guys, because you will be ready to take on any stressor in the world. 